Greetings. Thank you, thank you for welcoming to, uh, me to Planet DrupalCon here. And uh, I'm especially thankful for you guys giving me the official hangover slot. So this is, uh, what, two nights of parties in. And those of you who are brave enough to come out, I want to thank you a lot for that. So I am on the Twitters, and I know that you guys have the opportunity to ask questions and things like that. But if you ever want to follow up on anything I talk about, we'll get this away, out of the way up front. Find me at Luke W. Ask me anything. And because it's the hangover slot, I uh, don't want to do anything too difficult this morning. So I actually came to you guys with a pretty simple message. And that simple message is just this. The things that we do on the web, increasingly I think we should start doing for mobile first. And why this is a different message than what we may be used to doing is for years, any of us that have done things on the web have sort of started with the desktop, laptop, notebook experience in mind, right? That's sort of been the baseline for what defines a website, a web application. But things are changing so dramatically these days and so fast that I think this is sort of becoming a backwards way of doing things in light of where we're at and where we're going. And so my simple message to you guys, again, hangover slot, bear with me, right? is let's start thinking about things for mobile first. And before you say, well, why should we listen to this guy in the, in the green shirt up here, there's a couple other people who have a much higher pay scale than me and see a lot more information about the internet than me that are taking a very similar approach to thinking about the web. This is Eric Schmidt, uh, Google chairman, formerly CEO, and he's got a quote up here that says, Google is doing mobile applications first because they're better apps, and the full quote is actually because that's what Google programmers want to work on. And if any of you have any familiarity with Google, what the programmers want to do is kind of what they do. Uh, but Eric also has a number of real reasons behind this approach. And bear with me for a second, I'm going to do some CEO speak. He calls the mobile device the high volume endpoint of three concurrent trends. What does that mean? Well, the three trends that he's talking about are one, network connectivity, which is that we have the ability to get access to the internet pretty much anywhere and everywhere, right? We're not isolated to the broadband pipes in our homes and offices anymore. The devices that we can connect to the internet anywhere and everywhere are very rich in processing power. The things that we carry with us in our pockets these days are way more powerful than what it took NASA to send someone to the moon. And the third, piece of these trends, which kind of comes together to form this triumvirate, if you will, is uh, we have cloud-based solutions for software running remotely. We have the ability to access our documents, our applications, our content, our information, all through the network with these little devices. So those three thi things together really change things pretty dramatically, enough that Google has sort of taken on this mobile for first mantra. This is my uh, friend Kate over at Facebook. And uh, she heads up the front end design and engineering team. And again, a similar message, starting to think about mobile first, desktop second. And the follow on to Kate's quote is, well, this really helps us figure out what matters up front. Company that you might not necessarily expect to be talking mobile first, but I think a lot of their recent actions indicate that they're pretty serious about this. This is the CTO of Adobe, Mr. Kevin Lynch. And he describes this change that we're seeing right now with mobile, an even bigger shift than what we saw when the personal computer came about. And just so we're clear that this applies to lots of different domains, because I always get asked, well, what about me in finance? What about me in healthcare? This is uh, Bill, who's the creative director over what was formerly known as Bank Simple, now known as Simple, where they're trying to reinvent the bank, right? And very, you know, what well, could be more financial than a bank, and uh, again, they're going for mobile first because it helps them really figure out what they need. So it's not just me talking about this, but I still don't think you should do things just because other people tell us to, right? So for the remainder of the time that I have here, I really want to talk about the reasons why this approach makes sense and dig into a lot of information and sort of insights around kind of the complete picture of starting with a mobile mindset for the things that we do on the internet. And the three reasons that I want to call out in particular, one is we're seeing astounding growth on mobile, which leads to new opportunities. 
working on mobile comes with a natural set of constraints. Just the, the sheer um, human factors and ergonomic considerations that we need in order to make a device mobile put a lot of constraint on it, which when you absorb those constraints makes you really focus down. And last but not least, it's not just about these limitations. It's really about a whole bunch of new things that we can do that are, I think, very, very exciting and take us well beyond what we can do with desktops and laptops and sort of what we've traditionally known as personal computers. So those are the three things. Let's start with the uh, first one here. Look at the growth story. And in order to talk about the growth story, I want to talk about babies. And uh, this is how many babies are born in the world per day. 371,000. So people are pretty, pretty active, right? We seem to seem to have our stuff together. This is how many iPhones are sold per day. So in the evening hours in the bedroom, you know, I don't know which device is winning these days. <laughs> if you look over on the Android side of the coin, we got 700,000 Android devices activated per day. Woohoo, Android go. Wow, all right. A lot of excitement for Android here. That's now add up iPod touches and iPads to this mix. And so you got this, there's a total number of iPhones, iPods, iPod touches, and uh, iPads, AKA iOS devices. And that number jumps up to 562,000 per day sold, 200,000 Nokia smartphones. And by the way, 984,000 Nokia feature phones. Increasingly, those are running decent browsers like WebKit. Blackberry, still alive, kinda. I had 143,000 BlackBerry devices per day. So let's add this up. This is about one and a half million mobile devices entering the world per day compared to 371,000 ch children entering the world per day. Right? It's pretty substantial impact when you look at it. And if any of you have seen the Terminator movie thing, are you familiar with that? Yeah, so this is sort of the beginning of it, right? So there's a lot of these devices, but okay, so we're shipping a lot of plastic glowing rectangles around the world, right? What does that mean? How are they actually getting used? And this is where I think it starts to become interesting because not only are there a ton of these devices entering the world every single day, but they're being used in the ways that computers are being used, the way personal computers are being used. If you look at the history of personal computing, this comes from a blog called Simcoe that does a lot of great number crunching. And you sort of look at the first 15 years, right, 1975 on, you see Atari, Commodore, Amiga, all these early entrants trying to figure out what is the personal computer, how will it help people, what's it gonna be? And um, this is pretty typical for any kind of new technology, right? There's a lot of early entrants, they're shaking things out, they're trying stuff, and over time, a couple of them stick around. In the case of personal computers, this is the world we entered for the next 15 years. Hello, Redmond, right? And you can kind of see Apple just barely hanging on by a little thread right here. Next 15 years, though, is where things get interesting. And I want to zoom in in the last three. This is from about 2008 onward. See that red and green slash just eating into the Wintel pile? Right, that's Android and that's Apple. In particular, iOS devices. And after we had this many years, right, that's, you know, 20, 30 years of graphical user interface or desktop computing, the rate at which these devices are eating into the personal computing market share is just astounding. Um, and so not only are there a lot of these devices entering the world, they're being used as personal computers. In fact, I'll talk a little bit later about I, I think they're actually becoming the personal computer we've been promised for so long, right? The previous thing we called the personal computer, the big plastic box that sits under your desk that you blast with an air can, your mom does her taxes on it. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's not really the personal computer. The personal computer is the thing that's always with you, always connected, has your stuff on it. And the, as I mentioned earlier, these devices are connected to the network, right? We've got about six billion mobile connections today. And I left this number in here. I should probably do a slash through this because this is a projection from Cisco. It sees all the network traffic going worldwide. They're predicting that number is gonna move to about 12 billion in 2020. They upped that to 2016. So they pulled their projection in for how many of these mobile device connections we're gonna have by four years. 
again, it shows you just how fast things are happening here, right? In fact, we're there in the Cisco data, they're showing about 26x worldwide growth. So a lot of devices being used for personal computing connected to the network. And the very interesting thing about this opportunity is it's not just that people you know, are moving from the desktop to, the, to, to mobile devices, as we'll talk about here. We have a whole generation of people that are sort of starting their network experience on mobile devices. So if you look at Africa and Asia, this might not be too surprising to you guys, because everybody sort of has this stereotype developing world. But in these continents, to be precise, 50% um, of people don't get on the internet using a PC, a desktop or a laptop. They get on with a mobile device. In fact, all the way back in 2009, 50% of all new network connections came from mobile devices. Right? So we have a whole generation of people here that that's how they start using the web and the internet through mobile. A uh, similar story in India. But where it gets a bit more interesting is, let's look at the UK. 22% of people never or infrequently use the desktop to get on the internet. That seems sort of shocking. The US number might even be more shocking. Um, take that with a grain of salt, perhaps, because it's self-reported survey data. But the one that I do believe, because we're seeing strong evidence of this, is that within the next couple years, more mobile traffic than personal computer traffic in the United States. And so again, this creates a whole new set of people to reach that are really starting on the web mobile only. And I think we have a very hard time putting ourselves in the shoes of these people because we have 20 plus years of the desktop web ingrained in our heads and our hands. We have 30 years of graphical user interface that we've grown up on and used over the years. Right? It's very hard to shed that and just say, well, what if I only have a mobile device? Yet, countries and places that are starting like this are leapfrogging us in certain ways. So I live in Silicon Valley, and in uh, Silicon Valley, we refer to Kenya as the Silicon Valley of banking, because I believe something like 20% of GDP gets done through mobile transactions in that country. Right? It's just crazy. When you think about like where we are with mobile payments and sort of um, mobile integration within our overall economy, we're, we're way, way, way behind. Now, when you take advantage of this mobile opportunity, the fact that there's all these devices that are being used for personal computers, actual businesses can spring up. As an example, PayPal. PayPal originally started life as, it was conceived of life as a mobile payment solution. The, basically, the ecosystem wasn't ready yet, so they went to desktop and web payments, but obviously they've been waiting and waiting for this to sort of come of age. So in 2009, they did about $141 million in mobile payments. 2010, that number grew significantly to $750 million. 2011, $4 billion, right? So what do you think that curve looks like? And this is that opportunity I'm talking about. All these devices being used for personal computing create these kind of opportunities. And you're also starting to see a number of web services, and these are sort of the biggest web services on the internet, crossing the line of more mobile use than desktop use. Twitter right now, 55% of users are on mobile. Pandora, 70% of their usage is on mobile. Companies like StumbleUpon, 800% mobile growth. And when you start, and it's not just these sort of bleeding edge companies. The Weather Channel falls into this category. They do 1.3 billion page views on mobile, 1.1 billion page views on desktop, laptop per month right now. And when you start to see this kind of growth and when you start to build on mobile, you really quickly jump into this, well, wow, we learned a whole bunch of stuff. Let's take what we learned from mobile and apply it elsewhere. Ultimately, if you sort of follow the trend lines and you look to a country like Japan, their largest social network, Mixi, four and a half years ago, 14% of their total traffic was on mobile. Today, 85% of their mobile traffic. 85% right, of their total traffic is on mobile. And if this is the world you live in right here, then a mobile-first approach to design and development starts to make a ton of sense, right? And again, the early indicators we're seeing for some of the largest internet companies is that this trend is happening. Even companies like YouTube, uh, a lot of times the assumption about who's going to watch video on mobile phones, right? Uh, I believe it's something like 400 million 
views on mobile per device, or per day on YouTube. I can pull up the stat later. But uh, they predict in the next year or two that mobile is going to become the majority share of their usage. Right? So even video watching falls in this category. So this is this transition, right? More on mobile than on desktop. But there's also additional usage. And what I mean by additional usage is the fact that you have these devices with you anywhere and everywhere, and they're connected to the network, means you can start to use the internet and internet services in places you didn't before and in ways you didn't before. So the local ratings and reviews service Yelp, 40% of all their searches happen on mobile devices. At the time this data was pulled, the amount of their total audience that was on mobile was only 8%. So 8% of their audience is on mobile, and they're responsible for 40% of all the searches that are happening on the service, right? Just imagine that the, the volume that has to be happening there in order for that to sort of be the case. And so it's this additional time. And you have examples of this all the time, in, in, including like new ways of using stuff. Every, other, every second, somebody calls a local business from Yelp. People that use the real estate service Zillow on mobile use it in the locations where they want to buy a home. And then there's the cross-channel story, which I would love to have more time to talk to you guys about. But we assume if we get a customer on mobile and a desktop, it's sort of one plus one equals two. Usually it's more. So people that use Facebook on mobile are twice as active on Facebook in general um, than non-mobile users. And since I'm talking to a bunch of uh, folks who like the web, I want to point out something really interesting around mobile web versus uh, native applications. This is always an ongoing debate, right? App versus web, no matter how many times we talk about it, people want to keep talking about it. Facebook has 425 million mobile users. That's about a little bit more than half of their total user base right now is on mobile. 50% of those are on the mobile web. 50% of them use all their native apps together. This is the company that has the number one iPhone app, the number one Android app, the number one BlackBerry app, and apps across all these platforms. All of these native mobile applications together equal how much attention they get on the mobile website. And they recently posted this up on their blog. Right? We see more people accessing Facebook on the mobile than all their native apps combined. And when you start thinking about you know, mobile strategy, do we build apps, do we build mobile websites, I think statistic like, statistics like this really illuminate the power of the web to reach people on these devices. Uh, it's not just about native applications. Okay, speaking of the Facebook app, this is the guy that built it, Joe Hewitt. He has a quote here that I think illustrates the next point I want to make, which is when he started building this application, first he thought he was going to kind of create a companion for Facebook, but really quickly he figured out he can create something better. And this is the second piece to this uh, mobile first story. It's not just let's ride this giant hockey stick of growth to make sure we take advantage of this opportunity. It's let's see how we can make our overall product experience better by embracing the things that make mobile unique and make mobile work. And in particular there, I think there's a number of constraints in mobile devices that force us to focus down to what matters. And those constraints come from the need for these things to come with us. Right? In order for us to use something anywhere and everywhere, it has to be portable, it has to be small, it has to connect to the network anywhere and everywhere. There's basic human factor stuff that uh, influences how we design for it. So for years, those of us that have worked on the web have had this debate about how much screen space we have, right? Anybody get involved in these things? Any, you know, nobody, somebody that lost a life to this debate? or at least a lot of pride or, or angst, right? So we went back and forth, back and forth, and finally we sort of agreed we have 1024 by 68. We don't really, right? It's sort of an illusion. Size changes based on um, windows, desktops, what have you. But this is sort of where we landed. And if you take kind of where the typical smartphone screen sits and you go to 320 by 480, you just lost 80% of the screen space. That means 80% of the stuff that's on your existing desktop page won't fit. Just won't fit. And it has to go away, which I think is awesome. Because it's not like we just fill our websites with a bunch of stuff, right? <laughs> Nobody would ever just be like, oh, there's some empty pixels there. Let's cram some lucky in love sweepstakes, right? 
Who would think of such a thing? Ding. So I'm going to pause for a second here. Um, are you guys familiar with this principle from psychology called change blindness? So change blindness is if I show you two images and they're really similar, you might not see the difference. So your, your mind dies and you just can't process. So just bear in mind, it might take you a second, but I'm going to show you Southwest Airlines desktop experience, Southwest Airlines mobile experience. Just see if you can spot the difference, okay? So try this. <laughs> Let me do it again. Some of you laughing. <laughs> Probably means you didn't see it, so let's just bear with me. Did you catch it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hangover slot. So, what do we have here on the Southwest Airlines website? Well, you had to get rid of 80% of the stuff. So, what do you keep? Well, you keep the things that make the company money. They sell air reservations, they sell car reservations. You keep the things that the customers that use Southwest Airlines want. They want to check into their flight, they want to see their flight status, they want to manage their rapid rewards. And maybe if they're you know, loyalists, then ding, they can keep up with fare alerts. And again, this is good for business. This is how they make money. This is good for clients because this is what their clients want to do, right? And there's no room for anything else. And I think once you take this sort of mobile plunge, right, once you use mobile as a wedge to agree upon what really matters, you can keep this when you move up to larger screen sizes. There's no reason the priorities of your content or your services should change just because the screen got bigger. Right? You still do what you do, you still have the customers you have. And so if Southwest Airlines started with mobile first and then they moved up to the desktop, maybe they would end up with a layout like this. Again, focused on these core important things up front. Let's look at another example. This is a photo sharing site called Flickr. You may be familiar with it. Chances are you're not familiar with all of it. Over the years, Flickr has grown, right? And uh, in this nav, they've got about 60 plus options. And it's great, people love Flickr, they want more features, so they keep adding them. But when it came time to transfer Flickr over to the mobile web, a team had to figure out, well, what are we gonna put the focus on? Because they went from 60 plus options down to about six. There's two things that are duplicated on here. Um, and what did they do? How did they do this? Well, they have to know their audience. They have to understand what people want to do with Flickr, how they want to do it. Sort of design 101, right? And what do people do on Flickr? They check if anybody's commented or liked their photos. They see if any of their contacts have uploaded anything, or they kill some time looking at beautiful pictures near them or that have been ranked as interesting. Right, so again, it's that primary focus on the stuff that matters that stems from understanding your audience. Design 101, but mobile sort of gets you there really quickly, which is why I love this mobile first focusing capability. Uh, let's look at a non-homepage example. This is Expedia. I fly. This is the page on Expedia that tells me when my flight leaves. <laughs> this is the part of the page that has that information. The rest of it, I believe, should pixelate and die. <laughs> now, let's compare that to the mobile version. Thank you, thank you. I feel like I'm pulling rabbits out of my hat here. <laughs> now, the amazing thing is that they're using principles here like visual hierarchy, right? Look, they sort of call out the time the flight leaves, where it's leaving. You can really nicely move through the, your itineraries by date or by the different trips you have. And here's the real stinger. This is the thing that just kills me. If you use their app, just when you turn it on, it says, where should you be? Flip it and see. You flip the device that uses the accelerometer to detect that an orientation change has happened, and it says, get your butt over to Terminal B, your flight's leaving in 15 minutes. So let's just contrast this for half a second, right? Here, trying to find my flight, versus I hit a button, flip the phone, and it tells me where I need to be right now. These two experiences are coming from the same company, right? How are they so dramatically different? Well, I think the constraints of mobile, again, force you to focus. And here we're seeing the capabilities in play, right? The accelerometer is a nice little addition that helps this play out, which is kind of what the third section will be. Uh, next constraint that we deal with is this. 
Has this ever happened to anybody? I call out AT&T here, but I, I, you know, I've talked in different countries, and I usually like swap out the operator carrier name. So when I go to like the Czech Republic, I put in Vodafone, and I put up that joke, and they're like, ha, 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 Vodafone sucks. <laughs> Just go anywhere, swap out the name, and it still works. So because the network cannot be there, and you know, this isn't because AT&T is a terrible company or anything like this, or Vodafone is a terrible company. This is because it's really hard to give you network connectivity everywhere and anywhere, right? And sometimes it's just not gonna be there. And many times it'll be not as good as it could be, so we really have to focus on making things fast and performant. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do to send less things, file request size, we, um, file size, we can take advantage of some new capabilities. The bottom line is if you work with mobile first and you make it fast enough for these network situations that you deal with on mobile devices, get what, guess what? It's gonna be blazingly fast on a desktop. If you can get it to load real quick on a 3G device, when you get to the desktop, it's gonna scream. Which, it turns out, is awesome. Because study after study after study shows 100 millisecond delays can have a big impact on your business, right? Whether your business is serving up, is selling things, whether your business is doing search results, whether your business is serving content pages, doesn't matter. Every single time anybody studies this, they find that performance has a strong impact on overall user experience and the bottom line. So make it fast enough for mobile, it'll be fast enough for the desktop. And I, again, I believe this is a natural constraint that comes from mobile devices. This is uh, Mike, one of the co-founders of Instagram talking. I love this quote, nobody likes to wait, why they'll wait. This totally epitomizes how many of us use our mobile devices, right? You're sitting in the line waiting for your coffee. Do you wanna sit there waiting for the page to load? You're waiting while you're waiting. It's sort of like death by a thousand cuts. And Instagram does a lot of very interesting things. They actually credit being fast with their growth. They got somewhere like uh, 27 million users or something ridiculous on just an iOS app. I believe they got 12 million users in 12 months, uh, which is just crazy. And they do a lot of things behind the scenes so that what they'll do is they'll perform actions optimistically. If you comment on something, they'll sort of show you the comment and in the background go and try and push it to the server rather than waiting for the server to respond. They'll change which images they're loading based on where you scroll to. While you're filling in a registration form, they'll load suggested users for the next page so that when you get there, it's ready for you. And most importantly, they start uploading a photo as soon as you enter it. While you're sitting around playing with captions and deciding where you're gonna share, the photo's already being uploaded. So that when you're done, it's like boom, the photo's there. Right? Speed is a critical feature. And the last bit of constraint here, in addition to these screen sizes and um, these, these bandwidth considerations that we have, is around just the, I guess, environmental considerations around how we use these devices. And this stuff is fascinating to me because as we enter a multi-device world, the way we use the internet changes. And so this is traditionally how we've used the internet, right? You're sitting on a big screen, you got power, you got a network, keyboard, mouse, comfy chair, sitting in a desk. And uh, the latest Apple accessory, which I believe they haven't announced yet, but I'll give you a sneak peek, uh, the coffee mug. Move to mobile and all this stuff changes. The screen is small. The battery can go out. The network's inconsistent. Because these things are portable, it makes a ton of sense to turn the entire screen into an interactive surface, so we use our fingers. And there's a ton of environmental sensors. It knows where you are, it knows the direction you're facing, it knows it can detect ambient light to know if it's near your ear or not, right? All kinds of things. And this makes this device, like I was saying earlier, very, very personal. When we also think about where do we use these devices, this is another part of these environmental considerations. It's not just these ergonomic things, it's also where do we use it? And while our stereotypical mindset of where somebody's using a mobile device is the business guy in the street trying to find directions to, or you know, he's late to a meeting or somebody's trying to find the hours for a restaurant, this is sort of what pops into our heads. It turns out 84% of people use their smartphones at home. You all do it, you're sitting on the couch, right, and you're farting around on Twitter while watching something on TV. 39% uh, of people admit to using smartphones in the bathroom. That makes 61% of people liars. <laughs> a 
it's statistics. You can kind of look at it one or both ways. But let's go continue down this list, right? At home, miscellaneous times, waiting in lines at work. In aggregate, this really tells me people use these things everywhere and anywhere. And because we use them everywhere and anywhere, we run into situations where we can be distracted. Even if you're on the couch watching TV, the TV's on, people could be moving through the room. You're not like in a cubicle, walled off, hanging out for a couple of hours. And if you're in this sort of situation, I like to think of people as a one thumb, one eyeball, right? Because that's the level of attention many times we have, which requires us to really focus our design. And this is why I consider a lot of these environmental considerations a constraint. They force us to simplify and they force us to make things that can be used with partial attention, one thumb, one eyeball. Now the last piece of um, the constraint puzzle here, we talked about you know, the, the ergonomics of these devices, we talked about where we're using. The last piece that I wanna look at is when do we use these things? Because this is actually really fascinating to me. So this is a graph of when people read articles they saved to read later on a service called Read It Later from the Department of Redundancy, Redundancies. <laughs> and what you basically see is people are asleep, they wake up, they read, they eat dinner, they read stuff, and then they go to bed. This is desktops, laptops, notebooks. Now let's look at when people read the exact same articles on an iPhone. And the first thing you notice is that they're still pretty much reading at any time, but when you contrast it to computer use, you can see that there's these short, burstier spikes throughout the day, right? It's not just this long, consistent uh, period, midday in the evening. And this mirrors how you use these devices, right? You pull them out in little bits at a time. Now, it gets really interesting when you look at when iPad users read the same articles. This is the same use case, reading articles that you save for later on the same service. Uh, so this is iPad users, again, contrast this to desktop, and what you can see is that people are really reading in the evening hours on their tablets. I swear I'm just reading web design articles. Let's look at news users. This is overall Comscore data on when people read news sites. And so this is desktop and this is tablet. And you see the same sort of behavior, right? Early morning, evening use. The tablets these days are very, uh, tablets, it's basically the iPad, no one else has really put anything out there outside the Kindle Fire that's getting a lot of traction. Uh, you can see it's basically a couch slash kind of bedtime device right now. And maybe a morning breakfast device. This may change as tablets become more popular inside the workplace, right? Sort of enterprise use. Maybe that line shifts, but this is where things look right now. And this is even more interesting. Here we're looking at the financial time. So we're drilling down into only a single website. This is when desktop users interact with the Financial Times, this is when smartphone users interact with the Financial Times. What's that morning spike? Is that a result of people waking up and they use their smartphone as their alarm clock, or their phone's just right there so they pull it up and start looking at it? Is it the morning commute on the way in the work? Is it because this is when the financial market's open and people are trying to get real-time data about what's going on wherever and wherever they happen to be? I don't know. The bottom line is every time you look at this data, it does show a difference in use just by swapping out the device. One more, this is LinkedIn, the overall professional network, and this is their total traffic. This is their mobile traffic contrasted to total traffic. So what's going on here? My, my idea is people are at work and they hate their job, hate their job, hate their job, they get on the bus and they're like looking for a new job, looking for a new job, passing out. It's just an inference. I could be wrong. And then if you abstract out uh, any service, right, no LinkedIn, no website, no Financial Times, you just look at when devices get on 3G networks, you can see the same pattern. Laptops, longer, extended sessions, smartphones, in, out, in, out, in, out. Now when you take all of these constraints together, I think they lead us to focus on more real world use cases. When you talk about where people use this, which is everywhere and anywhere, when you talk about when people use it, and you look at sort of these um, human factors considerations, I think it pushes you to real world use cases. So this is an infamous little XKCD comic that talks about the things that always show up on a university website versus the things people actually want. 
And this is a quote from the Mobile and Higher Education blog that says, I was looking at this diagram and I realized what we were putting on mobile was just the stuff on the right and none of the stuff on the left. And why is that? Well, screen space is small. What are you going to include? A usable campus map or a letter from the president? Bandwidth is small. What are you going to include? A virtual tour or the ability to actually call the campus? Right? Those and then real world use. People can use it anywhere, anywhere. Pushes you to the things people actually want. And again, if you start from mobile first, this is where I start to sound like a broken record, right? These constraints push you to these things that actually matter. They focus you to prioritize on things that are good for your content and service and for your customers. So that's the second piece to the puzzle, right? The growth story is, oh my God, tons of devices. Let's make sure we don't miss out on this opportunity. The constraint story is we've got a lot of things that sort of force us to prioritize, which is ultimately good for business. And then the third piece to the story is we have a lot of new room for innovation. We have the ability to kind of rethink the way we deliver experiences on the internet. And this stems from us having a new palette of capabilities. If you think about the stuff we sort of have on laptops, you know, we have pages, we have links, we have forms, we have SEO optimization stuff, we got a mouse and cursor, those sorts of things. We have a whole bunch of other things on mobile devices to use. We have a new palette that we can use to paint experiences. One of these things is this uh, little device orientation feature that I showed earlier in the Expedia example. That is, if you flip the device on its side, you can do something different. Now you can just make sure it lays out well. That's step one, or you can actually enhance the usability of it. This is uh, Gmail on Android, and you can see I've got this ability to type an email message. When I flip it on its side, what it's gonna do is give me a lot of room to compose that email, give me a bigger keyboard, move that done button up. If it hadn't adjusted the layout, the design, when I flipped it, this would be a worse experience. I have less room to type, right? There'd be all these little fields crammed in here. Instead, they use this capability to create something better. And you can use these little capabilities to change things that even seem very, very boring. So what could be more boring than reading an article on the web? Right? Of, of the 20 years of the web we've had, I don't think the act of reading an article has changed much. A bunch of text on a page, scroll down, right? Well, using these capabilities, in Instapaper, there's a little feature called tilt scrolling which if you turn it on, you can just tilt the device slightly to scroll at your own pace. None of the, you know, moving through the screen or with your cursor or your finger, you just move at your own pace, tilt it the other way if you want it to go the other way, tilt it more if you want it to go fast, what have you. All right, so one little capability used to innovate on something that's just been stagnant for years, which is uh, reading an article on the page. And you can go much further in terms of understanding where the device is positioned. It's not just this little accelerometer, we also have the gyroscope, which gives us 360 degrees of motion. So this is in the web browser on iOS, and you can have access to 360 degrees of motion on the device. So imagine, this video doesn't do it justice, but imagine I'm moving my phone around 360 degrees, and a 360 degree panoramic image is moving with me. What kind of use cases can I use this for? Let's say I wanna go buy a home. I'm looking at a 360 degree panoramic image, I move the phone as if I'm in the room. Right? That's a very different experience than thumbing through a slideshow of photos of a house. And the point I'm making here is that what's, what's important here is not these little bits of technology. What's important here is the use case, right? the thing that we're trying to solve, which is touring a home that you might want to buy, reading an article. We apply these capabilities to these situations. Another capability we have is location detection. And you can use it for a very simple use case, like find a hotel near me. There we go. Um, but even that, even that little simple use case is actually pretty revolutionary, right? For years on the desktop, I could tell with 99% accuracy that we are in the United States right now. Go forth and design. Today, with any decent Mobile device, you have multiple ways of getting somebody's location. You got GPS, which won't work great indoors, but can get you down to 10 meters. You got Wi-Fi, that'll get you down to 50 meters. Two thirds to three fourths of the time that a smartphone finds itself that's using Wi-Fi beacons. It's actually pretty accurate. So how can we apply this capability to a use case? Well, what about this sort of use case? You're either running late for a meeting or you're married. One of the two. 
And depending on which, this could become really useful. The ability for you to send your location and movement through space to another human being. So here I am, here's how I'm moving, I'll be there in five minutes. Right? And this is what this little app called Glimpse does. Again, in the web browser, you can see here's where I am, here's where I'm moving, here's how long it's going to take me to get to your place. Very useful if you're running late for a meeting or married. <laughs> Another example, this is touch. Right? So we have multi-touch sensors in these devices. And let's say that we want to show somebody the latest the results. Well, they can just pull down the screen, let it go, and it'll refresh rather than hitting buttons or things like this. Or we can allow them to get quick access to actions in their inbox by just sliding across an email and either deleting it, filing it, replying to it right then and there. And touch is actually a really interesting capability because it's really permeating just about any mobile device you look at. So this is Nokia's smartphone mix, which I think is representative of the industry. You can just see that dark green thing starting to dominate. This was back in 2010. Uh, and you can just see how it's really starting to take over mobile devices. And I'm actually really excited about touch because I think it enables us to do things with user interface design that we haven't been able to do for years. And what I mean by that is so much of our time is spent like double clicking on little icons and moving little X's over and resizing windows and you know, all this just administrative debris, if you will, associated with the graphical user interface that takes up a ton of time and keeps us away from the content. Contrast that experience to using the um, iPhoto app here on an iPad. If you want to see what's in a list of photos, just expand that list of photos, right? Let's see what's in here. Ah, oh, I see. Okay, now open that up. Now if I want to move the list of photos, I'm going to move it up and I'm going to move it down. I'm not touching any scroll bars or buttons. I want to see that photo, I touch it. I want to see the next one, move it out of the way. Move it out of the way, right? What I'm interacting with in all these cases is the content. I'm not interacting with any buttons or widgets or icons or any of these sort of layers of UI debris that we've come to live with. And the principles behind this is, you know, this has sort of been branded natural user interfaces. What I really like about this is trying to move us towards a reduction of the things that get in our way between the stuff we want to interact with and our computers, right? Like, our computers have had layers in between us and the stuff we want. What we want is the content. We want direct interactions with the content. We want to get rid of visuals that are not content. Now, while touch enables us to do some very interesting things here, it's also a little bit of a constraint because of this issue. Even a baby's fingers are too big for a lot of the target sizes we have on our existing websites, much less when you get into you know, basketball player size fingers. And as a result, one of the biggest changes and biggest problems people have, especially on like smaller touch devices, have you ever seen anybody try and use like a Kindle Fire seven inch tablet in um, portrait view? And you go to a regular web page, the links are just heinously tiny, right? You sort of have to use like fingernail tapping to get through them. And so this forces us again to really make our actions bigger, put less on a page, Oftentimes that looks visually bigger than what we want. So here's YouTube's mobile web experience trying to optimize touch targets. What you really want to avoid is situations like this. Anyone see a problem here? And you may laugh, but is this really a problem? Well, let's look at some data, right? The smaller you make your touch targets, the more errors people make, right? Even down at like five millimeters, one in 30 taps miss the target, much less when you get down here, which is what a lot of our web pages just by default render as on some of these screens. So while touch is a great capability to innovate on, it's also a bit of a constraint that forces us to rethink some of the things we do from a design perspective. So at this point, we've looked at a couple capabilities here. Uh, we've looked at device positioning, we've looked at the gyroscope, we've looked at location, we looked at multi-touch, uh, but there's a whole lot more. And all this stuff together, again, is this new palette that we can use to start painting new experiences for people. And the real magic, I think, starts to happen when you combine a bunch of these things together to really rethink an experience. So let's say we have something like location detection. We know where you are. We know the direction you're facing from a digital compass or a magnetometer. We have access to the video camera. We can really rethink, again, a common use case. So common use case, let's say we're out 
in London, we want to take in the sights. Somebody told us to travel on a tube. We can pop open our laptop, type London Underground into the Googles, and we end up on this page. Now, somebody's taken a lot of time to design this page. You can tell it's got nice visual design. The links are blue. There's a lot of white space. So I can quickly find the link labeled Tube Map, and I can click it. And then I can go to the next page. And there's you know, a visual affordance here. It looks like a tube map there. I can find standard tube map. Somebody's done some stuff with usability. There's a little PDF icon. It tells me how big the PDF is, 0.21 megabytes. So that's kind of nice. And then I can click on it, and now I can find the tube station nearest to me, right? <laughs> You're laughing, but this is like mind-blowing stuff, you know, five, six years ago, right? If I came to you six or seven years ago and I said, look, you type London Underground into box, up come map. <laughs> You'd be like, no, me no believe. <laughs> you dark science, you go away. <laughs> All right, you'd like burn me. He's a witch. <laughs> and now we look at it, we're like, oh, how quaint. This is. <laughs> and I don't mean the rat, I mean, this is using the capabilities it has. It's got, you know, links. It's got a mouse cursor, it's SEO optimization, you know, it's got layout of a page. It's using what it can to make this experience good. It's got PDFs, right? You can render PDFs in a web browser. We're using these technical capabilities. Here's solving that same use case on a mobile device with an app called Nearest Tube. And here I just turn it on and it uses my location and it uses the digital compass to show me the tube stations nearest to me. And it shows me sort of how far away they are. Now if I tilt it up, it's gonna layer more detailed information about the tube stations near me. It'll tell me what lines they serve, exactly how far away they are, so I can get a more detailed view. And then I can tilt it up a bit more and get that same detailed information about stations a little further from me, right? Same use case, different set of technical capabilities. The whole thing kind of looks like this augmented reality, crazy worldview. Um, now, I'm the first to tell you that there's some usability problems with both of these approaches, but man, are the two different, right? The mobile experience versus the desktop experience for solving the same problem, find me a tube station near me, is dramatically different. And though this augmented reality stuff is clunky, I think there's something very compelling about layering relevant digital information on your current view of the world. I'm here, I'm looking in this direction, give me the digital stuff that matters. Yelp has done some experiments with this, they sort of made it an Easter egg, they put it online and they're still shocked. I talked to uh, Jeremy, who's the CEO over there, a couple weeks ago, and he's still shocked about how much people are using this feature. Now, to ground ourselves a little bit on the web, what we looked at with Nearest Tube there is a native app. It does location detection, device orientation, digital compass, video camera access. We got three out of the four things there on the web, and one of the four we only have in uh, iOS the digital compass. So we don't yet have get user media API, which will kind of give us this video stream on which we can layer information inside of a video or a canvas element. So the web browser is a little bit behind, but as people of the web, I urge you to really advocate for better device APIs inside the web browser, right? There are a whole bunch of things proposed for access inside of the web browser that'll bring us up to further parity with native applications. And as somebody that, you know, really believes in the benefits of the web and loves the power of the web, I think, you know, the web should get some of this good stuff. And it's, it's happening fast, right? The vibrations landed in WebKit in February 20th. Battery status just popped up March 15th. You know, these are in the nightly builds. People are pushing some of these things. But pay attention to this space because I think it really does extend our capabilities and allows us to do very interesting things. What kinds of additional things? Well, if we had get, get user media, the API, and then we could do things like this, where we just point our mobile phones at a barcode, it tells us what we're looking at, it tells us how much it costs on the web, it tells us how people have reviewed it, shows us where it is near us, and then plots it on a map, here you are, here's where you can go get it, right? And forget scanning a barcode, just take a picture of the thing, it'll get you the same information. Or even better, you walk into an Apple store today and uh, you open up the, the Apple app, the Apple store app, you hit Easy Pay, go up to an item, scan it, tells you how much it is, you hit Pay, you type in your password, and you walk out. 
That's it. You just checked yourself out. Now, you may say, are people going to go scan barcodes? Uh, Red Laser, which got acquired by eBay about last year, 50% increase in barcode scans. Walgreens, 40% of their online prescriptions are scanned through a mobile device. Right? And this is, you know, embracing these device APIs and trying to push this stuff forward. It's really trying to advance the state of the web. Because right now, this is what buying an accessory on the web looks like on Dell.com. You know, fill in all your shipping information. Okay, d agree to the terms of service, continue. You know, how, which credit card are you going to use? Yeah, okay. All right, fill in all. <laughs> Keep going, buddy. Come on, continue. Okay. So they, even, they even have the uh, audacity to put up a message that says, you're almost done, right? <laughs> there you go. Versus the ex Apple example that we just saw, right, where I just kind of scan the dang thing, type in a password, and I walk out. Now, granted, one's in store, the other one's online, but um, I think we should have access to this stuff on the web. Because you can do more things than just, you know, check out and buying stuff. Google did this program with QR codes for the top 100,000 places in Google Maps. You walk up to them, you just sort of point your phone at the sticker, and it tells you the reviews, the menu, the phone numbers. Tesco, which is the star second largest grocery chain in South Korea, um, they want to become number one, but they want to do so not by building more physical grocery stores. And so what they've done is they've put up these posters that look like grocery store shelves in places like the subway. And it literally looks like exactly what you see inside the grocery store aisle. Except there's little QR codes that you scan. So while you're waiting for the subway, you're like, oh yeah, I need milk and cheese and eggs and bread and do, and then pay. And then you go home, and two hours later, a truck shows up with your groceries. Which in a major, yes, it's true. In, in a major city like Seoul, right, where most people don't have cars, they're traveling on the subway, this is awesome, right? And it actually is very, very useful and ultimately, I think, good for uh, that, the overall populace because it cuts down on the amount of traffic and people having rotten fish heads on the train. <laughs> uh, Google has for a long time been really into this using uh, video as input. You can, uh, again, scan an item, find out what it is. You can scan a wine label, find out what it is. You can scan a barcode, and using OCR, it'll sort of put that stuff in your address book. You can scan a work of art. It'll identify it for you. Uh, one of my degrees is in art history, which sadly is now useless. You can point it at a landmark. It'll use location in the image to tell you what you're looking at. You can point it at foreign language text. It'll translate it for you. With card I.O., you can point your camera at a credit card. It'll look at it. It'll grab the number and the expiration date and this stuff. You can essentially take a payment just by pointing your camera at something. Right? Uh, one of my favorites, which maybe doesn't seem that revolutionary today, but it's just so useful, you just point your camera at a check to deposit it. I think there's about nine or ten banks right now that do this. And then my favorite example of using the camera, because it's sort of like a real-time example, this is WordLens. And you just sort of point it at text, and it translates it in real time, right? So, I mean, this is like sci-fi-ish thing, right? And you say, well, how useful is this? It actually could, becomes really useful when you enter, let's see, oh, you don't need an internet connection. We'll see the really useful example in a second, I promise. Let's say you're heading over to the beach or so. This might be good to know, right? <laughs> and then uh, this prone might be also useful just before you order that Bolivian's anchovy slicey plate and tongue. And my favorite, <laughs> this is how the internet can help you people. <laughs> but you don't have to just point your camera at places and things. You can actually point it at people. This is an app called Recognizer where it uses facial recognition technology to identify somebody and uh, find their social networking profiles. Uh, Google's chairman, Eric Schmidt, has a really creepy quote where he says, we have facial recognition technology that allows us to identify you within seven images. That's not the creepy part. The creepy part, he says, you don't think there's seven photos of you on the internet? 
Uh, by the way, this used facial recognition technology from a company called Polar Rose that Apple bought, and subsequently there's facial recognition APIs in iOS. And uh, Tats, the Astonishing Tribe, got by RIM. So this stuff is getting uh, integrated. But the problem with all this pointing your camera at things with your mobile device is you know, Nokia tries to call it point found, but when I see somebody doing this, I like to think nerd found. Um, so it's kind of awkward. So instead we have things like RFID, radio frequency ID tags, that you just put it near something that has a little radio antenna that's broadcasting a digital identity, and it'll identify that identity and do something. So if you put it near a car, it'll play a video based off that car. If you go and put it near the hippo, it'll play a video near that hippo. And so we no longer need some of these awkward interactions of you know, capturing images with the uh, photo the video camera to identify an object, we can identify it because it's broadcasting a digital identity. Right? And this starts to really breed into the Internet of Things, which is one of those concepts that's talked about, talked about, talked about, and then one day you wake up and it's in your living room. Right? Um, we recently got this Nest thermostat. This thing has a smartphone processor in it, it has six sensors, it's connected to Wi-Fi, and it's a damn thermostat. So future is scary. Uh, now we've talked about a couple more mobile device capabilities. And again, this is stuff that we have to innovate. And this is, again, why when you start from mobile first, you have this set of things in front of you as ways to rethink the experience. If you constrain yourself to, okay, we're just going to work on a desktop, a lot of this stuff is left off the plate, and you might not think as broadly. And you might not consider new, more innovative ways for giving people access to your content and your services. And I haven't even touched on anything yet, on everything yet, right? Like voice recognition, this whole thing around Siri where you have natural vo voice recognition, find me someplace to eat near here, tell me to call somebody, and a whole slew of these developing commands that are getting built, right? More and more of these capabilities come out all the time and give us a way to rethink stuff. So looking at it in aggregate, right? This is sort of the overall mobile first story. A, we have this growth in both the sheer number of devices and the way they're getting used in terms of network connections, in terms of overall network traffic, as personal computers. And that gives us an opportunity to really take advantage of that. And frankly, many of us that have established companies and things that are rooted in the desktop web, sort of the way things have been on the internet, we are primed for disruption by companies that embrace this technique. I mentioned Instagram a few times, right? If you look at a service like Flickr, which sort of has its roots, ironically, in mobile, but predominantly on the desktop these days, and you look at a company like Instagram that only has an iOS app, they're taking off because they're really building in a mobile-first mindset. So there's an opportunity for disruption in addition to an opportunity for actual growth for established companies. Then we have these constraints, and those constraints are things like screen size, bandwidth, when and where people use these devices, how they use them, all that stuff together really makes us focus down on what matters, which I, as a design person, absolutely love. I love the idea of going into a room with 50 people that want to shove stuff on a homepage and be like, well, 80% of your stuff can't fit. I'm sorry, right? Just physically, it can't. Those constraints force us to prioritize, which ultimately I do believe is good for business, right? I have seen many, many examples where if you don't do right by the customer, ultimately you don't do right for the business. And last but not least, I won't belabor this point because we just walked through it, whole new palette of technical capabilities that allow us to do user experience design, product design, and sort of service design in new ways. And it gets really interesting when you start combining mobile with other devices, which is, again, a whole other area we could really start talking about. Right? What does the interplay between a tablet and a smartphone and now a TV or a wristwatch or whatever start to look like? Because if we project out to the future, um, I do believe we're going to have more screens in our lives as opposed to less. And I do believe more things will be connected to the Internet as opposed to less. And so what does that world start to look like? In that world, though, I do believe mobile is still going to be a priority bit because, frankly, it's the screen that's with you anywhere and everywhere and always connected, right? So very often it's the first screen that comes out and maybe the screen that comes out most often. So giving it sort of the priority that it deserves in that case is usually a good idea. And that's the story. If you want to talk more about it, I'm happy to. I'm
before. Sorry, I meant die down noise, but thank you, thank you. I believe we'll do some uh, Twitter Q&A now, yes? Yeah, we have some, some questions from the Twitters. Um, first question, uh, a couple of people asked about um, different ways in which uh, the constraints of mobile are becoming less relevant. Um, the increased use of tablets, one person asked about, and increasingly high-res devices. So I guess the general question is, are, are those constraints gradually going away? Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple constraints that are just sort of inherent to something being mobile, which is you're not gonna put a tablet in your pocket, right? So though more and more people are using a tablet, you don't see people out and about waiting in Starbucks on their tablet, right? And uh, because of that portability, I do still believe there's more use cases in that form factor of a device. So that constraint will sort of exist for a while until we have roll-up screens or things like that happening. And then also the bandwidth constraint is a very real one and it sort of conflicts with what's going on with retina displays, right? Because um, once, once again, like uh, I have, actually I can show you a little bit of a statistic on this. The abandonment of people on things that have sloppy network connections. Let me pull this bad boy up. 40% of people are gonna abandon your site after, whoop, two, you guys see this? There we go, 40% of people will abandon your site after three seconds, right? That's a very real thing and across the board, every single time you measure this, performance keeps coming up, keeps coming up, which is in conflict with some of this retina stuff. Okay, uh, that leads into another question um, asked by Felonious Monkey. Um, great username. Thank you, Monkey. Uh, mo most of the statistics you referenced are for service-based content. Uh, what happens to uh, browsing or surfing the web on mobile? What happens to just browsing and surfing the web in general? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So how does kind of mobile web use compare to desktop web use, I guess is the question? Or, or let's hear, I mean, maybe this will answer the question. Like um, this is sort of app usage, and this is the amount of people that use the browser. This is year over year growth. This is um, a little bit older. This is sort of towards the end of 2010, beginning of 2011. But as you can see, stats are pretty clear that the web, in general, and again, we can see this kind of in more recent data. This is uh, Q3 2011 across all smartphone platforms. In general, the browser, which is just one application, usually amounts to about as much network traffic as all of the other native applications pulled together, right? And you saw this in the Facebook data too, right? That all of their native apps together equal a little bit less traffic than just their mobile web application. Are, is the interaction model with those, that web, that browser-based interaction, is that um, primarily service-based or is that moving, like on a desktop browser, it's more, I don't know, surfing the web um, as opposed to going to a specific site and get, looking for specific information, I guess. Uh, I, I guess I'm fuzzy on the definition of service-based interaction versus browsing-based interaction because who knows which one's which. Um, what I can tell you is that people visit a lot of different websites on smartphones. The last data I saw is about 24 different websites a day. And um, the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these maybe quote unquote service things, if, if by that you guys are referring to like native apps, will drive use of the web browser. So email has a lot of use on smartphones and as soon as there's a link, guess where it goes, web browser. Right, uh, same thing with a lot, any of the other things that allow you to share links or URLs. Okay, uh, next question from Lewis Nyman. Uh, do you see long-form content creation becoming popular on mobile? The iOS uh, version of iPhoto got one million unique users in 10 days. If you look at all the top selling applications on uh, iOS, at least for the iPad, they're all content. Content creation apps are like in the top three, so like Pages, Keynote, GarageBand. Um, 
I think the popular assumption is to assume that things like tablets and smartphones are really only around content consumption, but when you actually dig into the data, it's a very different story, and content creation is a, a big piece of it. And so very often people will make this assumption like, let's leave this feature out for mobile because people won't do it on mobile devices, and quite quickly the opposite sort of comes true. Um, I think if you have something that's important to your business or your organization or your service, not letting people do it just because they're on a smaller screen seems like a missed opportunity to me. Um, that leads into a question Larry Garfield asked, which is um, in what circumstances uh, is a, a, a combined app for, or a combined interface for mobile and desktop not the right answer? Are there cases where it makes sense to split those up? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a number of cases where it makes sense to split things up. If you are really interested in optimization, either from a performance perspective or from an interactive perspective or for a content perspective, having the same content and an adaptable interface for everything, every device, probably not the best solution for you. And so there's a number of companies out there that will take explicitly the opposite approach, which is to say, we have a custom tailored mobile experience, we have a custom tailored tablet experience, we have a custom tailored desktop experience because they want to optimize the heck out of it. What you, and this is true for the web in general, what you lose um, is broad access. And you know, it, this, is, this has been true for the web forever. It's always been this tension between rich and reach, right? If you build, if you put 